Hi, everyone. Good morning. Welcome uh, to the Georgia Climate Project webinar. What does a changing climate mean for Georgia's infrastructure? We're going to go ahead and hop in today. We have an amazing uh, panel lined up, and we're so happy to have you. My name is Rachel Usher. I'm a project manager with the Georgia Climate Project. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, um, we are a group of nine colleges and universities across the state of Georgia answering two questions. What does a changing climate mean for Georgia and what can we do about it? Um, our work is sponsored by our many generous funders. Thanks so much for supporting all the work that we do. So as I mentioned earlier, we focus on these two core questions. What does a changing climate mean for Georgia and what can we do about it? We've built a network that spans the state of Georgia to address these questions. And we've taken on a variety of initiatives to support these goals. One of them is our Georgia Climate Information Portal. If you're not familiar with it, it's a resource online that has some info of the most current science answering um, questions like how does climate change affect our ecosystems and our coast. We've also covered these topics during our previous webinars. You might not, uh, I hope some of you have been able to attend some in the past. Um, this is our eighth webinar. They're all on our YouTube channel. So we do encourage you to go hop online and check those out if you um, want to learn more about some other themes. In addition to talking about the science, we're also really keen on sharing stories of Georgians whose lives and livelihoods have been impacted by climate change and are actively thinking about different solutions in our state. Um, our Georgia Climate Stories Navigator is an awesome part of our website, and we are in the process of developing a lot more of these climate stories um, to talk about all of the exciting work Georgians are doing across the state. Today, um, we will be live tweeting this webinar on our Twitter account. Um, you can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook. We'll be using the hashtag GCP webinar if you wanna connect with us, um, but please uh, follow and subscribe. We'll, uh, we post a lot of updates and exciting events from us and our partners online. I uh, would be remiss not to flag that there is a very exciting conference coming up this August 12th through 13th. The Georgia Climate Conference is hosted by our friends and good partners, the Georgia Department of Natural Resources in Jekyll Island. If you're interested in attending, the um, registration is now open for conference attendees, and there's some really exciting um, keynote speakers lined up, so I encourage you to go check out their website. Now, I know all of us are probably experts at this Zoom environment, but for all the participants joining today, um, it might be a little bit different than you're used to. We're in Zoom webinar, so you will not be able to turn on your camera or your microphone, but we do want to hear from you. If you look at the very bottom of your screen, there's a chat and a Q&A button. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Also in the Q&A, feel free to submit any questions that you have for our panelists. Um, we will um, be doing a moderated Q&A with them after each panelist speaks, and we'd really love to hear what your questions are. We will also be following up with a registration, or excuse me, uh, a link for a survey after this webinar is done. Please let us know how we did. We're always curious to hear feedback from you all. Without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and make sure we hear from our amazing panel about what does the change in climate mean for Georgia's infrastructure. We, like I mentioned earlier, we really have an all-star lineup of um, experts from across the state. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to our wonderful moderator for today, Molly Samuel, who's a senior reporter, senior environmental reporter with WABE NPR. Thanks so much, Molly. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks for having me. Um, so we have six panelists today. We're going to go through and have each of them will do a short presentation. We'll have time for a couple questions after each presentation. So you can enter your questions into the Q&A box as they're speaking. And then at the end, we'll have time for some more questions for everyone. Um, we're going to start with Evan Mallon. Dr. Evan Mallon is a researcher with the Urban Climate Lab at Georgia Tech School of City and Regional Planning, where he focuses on heat mitigation planning, vulnerability assessments in the urban environment, and teaches courses in urban environmental planning and design. Dr. Mallon is also an ORISE fellow with CDC's Climate and Health Program, where he works with cities and states across the U.S. on climate adaptation initiatives. All right, looking forward to your stop. All right, thank you very much, Molly. Um, let me just pull up my presentation here. So good morning, everybody. Uh, today, I'll be talking about uh, compound climate and infrastructure events. Um, <clears throat> this is based on some recent uh, research uh, that we've conducted in the Urban Climate Lab. Uh, and we are particularly focused on heat. Uh, so the compound event that we'll be talking about today is mostly around a compound 
uh, heat wave and blackout event and how dangerous that might be for folks in Atlanta and Georgia broadly. So heat is a hot topic in the news nowadays. Um, we have uh, rising temperatures in the Northeast and Northwest that are unprecedented. Uh, the Portland, Oregon heat wave has reached 116 degrees Fahrenheit, and that is wreaking havoc on its infrastructure. Remember back to your uh, high school physics class, what happens when things heat up is they expand. And if they expand and have nowhere to go, they might buckle instead. And so heat uh, can be extraordinarily dangerous for infrastructure. You see here, uh, when it buckles like that, it becomes highly unusable. We have planes uh, sinking into runways. We have uh, train tracks that buckle to the side and make it uh, unsafe to travel on. Of course, we have highways and roads that buckle upwards and are no longer safe to drive on. Uh, we've also been seeing um, a rising um, risk of power outages in this country um, over the last uh, 20, 30 years or so. In fact, a 60% increase in power outages, and that is both uh, number of power outages and duration of these power outages. Now, why are we at greater risk of uh, blackouts or power outages in this country? Um, well, a lot of it has to do with heat uh, and with climate change broadly. So you, can, you might have heat-related infrastructure damages, like uh, what you see there on the right that happened just uh, a few days ago, um, where the infrastructure can literally melt uh, with extreme heat. But this also happens when you have grid stress from high demand, as that temperature increases outside, we tend to crank our air conditioning more and more inside. We rely on this uh, as this is increasingly becoming an important uh, life support resource for us. This is critical household infrastructure uh, that really makes some of these areas livable in the country as these temperatures rise. And so we stress that grid and that may actually result in a power outage. Uh, but we also have preventative outages. Uh, out in the West, we have such issues with wildfires. Now, this is the Western US um, that uh, a lot of utilities will actually um, shut off the power preemptively to try and um, reduce the risk of potential wildfires that can come uh, straight from that infrastructure. So we end up with a lot of um, loss of power and as a result, loss of air conditioning, which really exacerbates our uh, heat risk. So heat is um, a major driver of public health concerns in climate change uh, because exposure to high temperatures can cause heat stroke, exhaustion, syncope, that is fainting, heat cramps, and when it gets bad enough, death. Uh, annual US heat related mortality may increase by up to 34,000. That may be a low estimate nowadays. It's a little bit of an outdated study. In fact, with this recent heat wave, this just came out uh, today, more than 230 deaths reported in British Columbia from the heat wave so far. And we expect this to continue to rise uh, for the entirety of the Northwest. This will be something we talk about for a long time and is unfortunately increasingly likely event uh, as our climate continues to warm. So how do we study this in the Urban Climate Lab? Um, well, we do so with a lot of modeling. Uh, and so in a recent study, we uh, modeled uh, exterior temperatures. This is a downscale climate model using something called the Weather Research Forecasting Model, or WARF, that's here in the sun, um, where we modeled exterior temperatures for all of uh, Atlanta, Phoenix, and Detroit. And uh, we in the Urban Climate Lab have found that the uh, urban heat island of uh, Atlanta can be uh, pretty severe. Um, daily highs, average daily highs across the summer can differ by over eight degrees, depending on just how we have built our city, how much uh, impervious surface, how much blacktop material we have that's soaking up the sun and warming up as compared to more vegetated areas um, that remain a lot cooler. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but then we coupled that um, with an Energy Plus model that modeled interior temperatures. So the temperatures that we would be most often exposed to sitting around at home. Um, and we simulated also a blackout. So this is a concurrent heat wave and blackout event when we need that air conditioning the most. Uh, we applied that to every residential building uh, in all of Atlanta, Phoenix, and Detroit. And we looked at it in terms of uh, heat index. Um, rather than just temperature. This is that kind of feels like temperature that brings humidity into play as well. Um, and this has a, a closer correlation with uh, human health. This is what we really wanna be paying attention to when we talk about how heat might affect us. Uh, and so it goes anywhere from uh, no risk, that's less than 81 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, all the way to extreme danger, over 129 degrees Fahrenheit inside. And you can see 
the exposure risk uh, gets worse and worse as you get through uh, these heat index classes, all the way to heat stroke likely. So uh, this is uh, every uh, residential parcel mapped out in Atlanta. Uh, and you can see that when we have the power on, even during a heat wave, we're generally doing okay. We're at that no risk category. Of course, we have a few houses, a few neighborhoods that are at greater risk, and that's an ongoing problem we need to discuss. But let's shut the power off. It gets really bad. Uh, the vast majority of Atlanta households will become uh, in the caution or extreme caution range, uh, which just to remind you, that's where we really start seeing uh, heavy health impacts. Uh, we modeled this for, as I mentioned, Atlanta, Phoenix, and Detroit, and we see this in all three cities. So this really is uh, a, a broad study across a variety of climate zones, and I would argue that this really applies to much of Georgia as well. There is uh, no area that is necessarily safe from this because we don't have a lot of very cool areas until you go maybe up a little higher in the mountains in North Georgia. Um, you can see just uh, how bad this can get, particularly in hot cities like Phoenix, where you start reaching this danger and extreme danger category. So this is really impacting the types of temperatures that we would actually be exposed to during a heat wave, which as I mentioned, uh, can cause increasingly likely blackout at the same time. So this is not outside the realm of possibility, and this is not even in a future climate. This is modeling a, uh, a historic heat wave that we've already experienced. So this is something that we may face even this summer. If you look at uh, the share of household risk, um, we see that uh, when you have this kind of compound event, there are no parcels left that are left at no risk. Every single household is at least in this caution territory when we have that concurrent event. And one thing that's interesting that came out of this study is we talk about heat, um, mostly through um, uh, the urban heat island. And what we found actually is that the urban heat island is not as important as the type of housing that you live in. Um, and so we found that single story or one story single family uh, units uh, have the hottest uh, interior temperatures um, because there's a small area, small volume. They heat up very quickly. And so this may be something that we want to pay more attention to moving forward. Uh, you also see here um, that uh, this is a relative risk of mortality, uh, northern versus southern cities. Southern cities are a little bit more resilient. Um, so uh, you can see here in that arrow that we have, um, we've kind of follow more along the line of a southern city now, but when we expose our bodies to air conditioning all the time, our bodies actually think that we are living more in a northern city. And so uh, that relative risk of mortality might really skyrocket. So this may actually be worse than we think it is. Uh, we also know that observed uh, temperature change in the country, uh, Georgia is actually looking relatively okay, but the rest of the country is not looking so good. And so this may actually cause a lot of uh, climate migration to our area um, from the rest of the country, which will stress our infrastructure all the more. So very, very briefly, because I'm running out of time here, what can we do about it? One thing we can do is try and prevent um, heat from getting too high, uh, both inside and outside of our homes. Things like tree planting, cool materials, and green roofing can help be a passive heat management strategy. So this is something that would kick in and work even if we have no power. We know that trees really cool us down both through shading and through evapotranspiration. Just standing next to a tree might make you feel two to nine degrees cooler even if you're not standing in the shade. Uh, we can see that it really cools down our surfaces. This is one that's cooled over 50 degrees just by uh, being inside versus outside of that shaded area. Cool materials, a very similar uh, kind of response. You can see that if we build lighter shades, both in our rooftops and in our surfaces, that we're going to have uh, much cooler um, pavement or much cooler rooftops. Same for green roofs. Uh, green roofs will cool down our buildings significantly because it reduces the solar load that's going to be hitting those buildings and it's going to cool down the interior as well. Uh, we can also enhance our electrical security, uh, things more like distributed solar and other renewables uh, that remove us from the grid. Local microgrids may actually enhance our resilience by not relying so much on that grid. Uh, so if the grid goes down, we may still have a backup. Similarly with uh, enhanced energy storage, we can hold on to that energy that we produce ourselves. We get just a little bit more time on that air conditioning, even if the power goes out broadly. And of course, we want to be looking after our vulnerable populations. I won't talk too much about this. I believe the next panelists will be digging more deeply into this uh, idea of energy security. So I'll let them handle that. 
But thank you very much. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. Check out our website, urbanclimate.gottech.edu for more of what we're doing here in the Urban Climate Lab. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Mallon. Um, we've got one question that I think can be a quick one, which is just a request for um, links to your studies. So maybe um, after we're done with Q&A, you can just drop links in if you've got them. And then sure uh, one, one other question for you. How would the blackout with heat wave look for rural areas? It would still be a major risk, but with, with a different change of scenery, little to no blacktop or concrete, would risk change under that? Yeah, so actually uh, all evidence is pointing to that being an even greater risk. Um, so we found that even though we know urban areas are much warmer uh, due to the urban heat island effect, uh, we found that that uh, UHI penalty, uh, as I presented earlier, is not as bad as the housing penalty. So if you're a single family home without much tree shading and you're out in rural areas, you're going to have just as bad of that interior temperature like we talked about, and you're further away from our medical infrastructure. You might be further out from hospitals or from uh, various places where you might cool down like cooling centers. So uh, in many ways, that risk is actually even greater in our rural areas. Thank you. Um, we're gonna move on to our next panelist now, but we'll have time for more questions with you at the end too. Thank you so Great. much for the presentation. Thank you. So our next panelist is Marsha Gozier. She's the Central and Southwest Georgia Just Energy Organizer for the Partnership for Southern Equity. And in this role, she focuses on equity and racial equity through an environmental, economic, and political development lens. Specifically, Marsha has created hubs and organized around environmental justice issues in the cities of Columbus, Macon, Warner Robins, Fort Valley, and Albany, Georgia. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. and. Um... Evan, I uh, really enjoyed that presentation and uh, especially the question uh, towards the end in regards to, to rural areas and the impact of it. As um, you all are aware, my name is Marcia Gosier and I am the Rural Organizer and Special Projects Person for the Partnership for Southern Equity. Uh, the Partnership for Southern Equity is a Black Latin nonprofit based out of Atlanta, Georgia, and we focus on racial equity matters through an ecosystem lens. Uh, we have a just energy lens that focuses on you know, energy burdens and, and just ensuring sustainability. Uh, we have a just opportunity circle and that focuses on economic development, um, of course, just health. And when we speak of just, we're not saying just energy. Uh, what, we, what we look to ensure is just and fair uh, placement of policies um, that can impact people, Black people and people of color throughout the American South. Um, because, you know, the focus has been a lot lately on the American South um, and just how sustainability and infrastructure is just behind. We, we're very excited about the racial equity executive order that was passed by the Biden administration and trillions of dollars being placed into infrastructure. While we think that conversations are great, uh, the focus should be placed on ensuring that though that money is not favored for affluent communities and that they actually get to the communities that need them the most. A lot of times when we have these conversations about infrastructure, uh, we fail to mention the, the targeted and intentional um, and historical racial aspect to infrastructure, especially when we're speaking to, to great infrastructure. Um, a lot of times we lift up the good deal by President Roosevelt, but when we take a very deep dive into the good deal and actually look at it, we see where there's actual verbiage, where the infrastructure was not placed as it needed to be in low wealth communities and in communities with majority black and brown residents. Um, when we go in, we can actually see that you had a lot of neighborhoods that were specifically targeted. Uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma has been on the lips of many within the past three months, but we need to be very aware that Tulsa, Oklahoma was just one of many places that was targeted, uh, that was wiped away, where, where Blacks were very successful um, after the Reconstruction era and you know, opening up businesses. And so you have places in Georgia like 
Atlanta, the Auburn Avenue area. Uh, we know that that is a historical place. That was a thriving Black community. Uh, you had your one of your first Black insurance companies. Um, you had Black millionaires there. And then when the DLT decided to create the interstate system, we can see now when you, if you're visiting Atlanta, that is one of the major um, interstate sections. And this interstate was placed in this community right slap dab in the middle. So now you have people that were displaced, you have businesses that were lost. And so a lot of times these things are by design. And so discussions need to be had and intentional actions need to in, in occur to ensure that the money trickles down and it reaches the communities that have been impacted the most. When we think about climate change, we just saw what the unfortunate situation had happened and so there's with the condominium in Florida all last week. And so there have been discussions that this could have been caused by potholes, uh, that this could have been caused by water receding, um, that the infrastructure on the building um, was questionable. So we have to take those things into consideration when we're talking about climate change and how it, it impacts all of us. Um, when we're having these discussions, we also need to look at the planning and ensure that we have people that are involved in the planning, that are gonna show compassion, that are going to ensure that these areas are reconstructed and rebuilt. Um, there's so much money that is going to trickle down from the Justice 40 initiative um, that not only will trickle down to our larger nonprofits, but to our grassroots organizations. And that's where we need to place the focus because if we're, we can have all the data in the world, but if we are not going into those communities and actually speaking to the people that are being targeted, the people that are being impacted by this, then we cannot effectively impact change. In looking at some of the, the target areas, uh, we could go all throughout the United States of America uh, from, from Compton, as I mentioned, Auburn Avenue, in coastal Savannah, in the Gula Geechee areas of coastal Georgia, South Carolina. And you can see where um, big bucks have been placed for resorts and displacing people. And so this is, this is a common tactic and quite simply, if you pay attention to the data and you really look at it, you can see that infrastructure has been used as a weapon. And so we have to, we have to pull together and hold, hold these entities accountable. Um, not just the residents, uh, but local leaders as well as state leaders and our federal leaders. And ensure, again, I mean, I, I just cannot bring this, bring this home enough. We can have all the discussions in the world, but at some point we have to have intentional actions behind those discussions. When um, Everett was mentioning just the climate change and, and air conditionings, of course, you know, those things are needed. But another thing that we aren't discussing are energy burdens and that there are actually people here who have to make a decision every month whether or not they're going to pay their utility bill, whether or not they're going to, you know, use that money for much needed prescriptions. This is impacting our elderly, especially in rural areas. Here in Georgia, we have three different ways to, that we may get power. In Georgia, in Atlanta and most of Georgia, we're fortunate enough to have, you know, uh, Georgia Power as the provider. So if you're, you're dealing with Georgia Power, you have more um, opportunities for payment arrangements and things of that nature if you're ever placed in that position. But you also have your EMCs and you have your municipal-led utilities. And what we are finding when we, we take a look at energy burdens, especially in rural areas, um, Central Georgia, which is where I am located, we're seeing instances, even this morning before I got on this call, um, I was speaking with a resident in the area. Um, he was a business owner, negatively impacted by COVID, and he's looking at a $4,000 utility bill. 
we know that there was many planks from uh, the Department of Justice throughout the United States um, just a month, a month ago. And there have been calculations where the counties are getting a certain amount, they would get double the amount of the city, and then the boards of education would get double those amounts. And so when we're reaching out, we're urging um, everyday citizens, people participating, please reach out to your county commissioners, reach out to your local legislators regarding this main um, that was sent through the American Recovery Act. And I believe a lot of counties in Georgia started receiving this money last month. Uh, when you go through the paperwork regarding this money, it actually states that it's for weatherization, um, for infrastructure, uh, that they should get input from communities. I like to lift up areas like the city of East Point, the city of Fulton, uh, Burke County, those areas have been very advantageous. They've been transparent, but you have a lot of smaller areas, uh, especially here in central Georgia, where local electeds are being mom about it. And you have residents who are hurting still. And for someone to have a $4,000 utility bill left over from COVID when money is not being trickled down, uh, you're seeing the money in larger areas, but it is not getting trickled down to our rural areas and our low wealth communities. And it, it is, it is, you know, it is heartbreaking um, to know that people are still being being impacted by this. Thank you so much, Marcia. Um, I, I have a question for you. When it comes to utility shutoffs and, and the energy burden, are there good examples? Have you seen this being handled well anywhere in Georgia? Is there sort of, you know, a, a, a community or, uh, a, you know, one of the power companies or local elected officials who are, are doing it well in your view or, or community members who've had good suggestions for how to handle it? Well, um, you know, as I mentioned with Georgia Power, when you're dealing with um, a Southern company, they, of course, they have the financial backing to be, a little, be more supportive in areas. However, we're finding um, in rural areas, you do have some, some municipal land and some M EMCs that were very advantageous uh, before COVID. Uh, Griffin, Georgia is one area that I can lift up. Um, the city of East Point, a lot of times we don't view East Point, Georgia as a rural area, but it is. Um, when they received funding from their legislators early in the year, um, they actually place credits for their customers uh, to use uh, for utility burdens, um, even to assist them with, with their rent if they needed it. So there, there are areas that were very advantageous um, and that understood the needs of their communities and heard the needs of their communities. Thank you so much. And we'll have time for more questions at sure. the end. Um, our next panelist is Dr. Rhett Jackson. Um, Dr. Rhett Jackson is the John Porter Stevens Distinguished Professor of Water Resources at the University of Georgia Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources. He has experience working as an engineer for the Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts, as a hydrologist and planner for King County Surface Water Management, and as an environmental consultant. His research focuses on the effects of human land use activities, specifically forestry, agriculture, and urbanization on water quality and ecosystem services. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm with the I'm a hydrologist with the School of Forestry and Natural Resources, but I'm also with the Institute for Resilient Infrastructure Systems at the University of Georgia. And we've recently in, entered into a partnership with the United States Army Corps of Engineers that we call the Network for Engineering with Nature. And the idea of applying natural infrastructure to, to infrastructure problems is relatively new. So part of our mission is to develop guidance and standards and monitoring protocols and life cycle assessment methods for natural infrastructure. And today what I wanna talk about is uh, opportunities for using natural infrastructure for mitigating sea level rise. Now in Georgia, everybody who lives on the coast already knows that the sea level is rising. They have daily or monthly um, reminders that the sea level is rising. 
And we can look at the actual NOAA data and see a strong and consistent trend in sea level rise. Um, this is for Fort Pulaski, Georgia, this sea level rise graph. Um, and then going along with sea level rise, we just have the natural dynamics of coastal um, environments, particularly barrier islands. And so one of the things that we, we kind of take for granted is that land stays put. But when you're dealing with a barrier island, that's not the case. And so one of the cool things you can look at on the web is that you can get USGS um, mapping of what coastlines in various places have looked like at different points in history. And some of these date back to, so they basically use old maps and um, plot the, sh the shore positions through time. And so this goes back to about 1830, but here's Jekyll Island, for example, and here's St. Simon's Island. You can see that Jekyll Island has generally had erosion on the north end and it's had deposition on the southern end. So essentially the island is migrating southward. This is a common thing. A uh, common thing in the coastal environment is that barrier islands tend to move over time. Um, when you compound that with flooding and you compound that with the frequency with which we get, you know, tropical storms, you know, you've got a very dynamic environment even before you've added sea level rise to it. So here is uh, one of the things we don't realize about sea level rise in barrier islands is that most of the, the increased flooding and the water level rise will occur on the backside of the islands, on the marsh side of the islands. So these are maps for current conditions for Tybee Island, uh, two feet of sea level rise on Tybee Island, and three feet of sea level rise on Tybee Island. And you can see that the, the flooding really encroaches from the backside, from the bay side. So in um, in terms of engineering with nature, we can think about sort of five basic types of natural infrastructure that we can apply to um, barrier islands and, and coastal environments for increasing their resilience to flooding. One is thin layer placement. So that's the idea of taking dredge materials and the Corps of Engineers is constantly dredging um, our rivers for navigation and creating a lot of dredge materials. And if you put that dredge material on the marshes in, in sort of thin lifts, you know, lifts of four to eight inches, um, then the marsh grasses can grow through it and you don't kill the marsh grasses, but you sort of allow the whole landscape to rise. For, for tidal creeks, erosion on tidal creeks for stabilizing the shorelines, we can use living shorelines, which also provide um, ecosystem services. We can do beach nourishment and dune restoration on the, on the fore side of the island to mitigate um, wave energy. And then we can also build natural sills using oysters or artificial reefs um, to reduce wave action in the, in the coastal environment. So, you know, the top, I got pictures here, what thin layer placement looks like. Oops, sorry, that's not what I meant to do. Um, down here, we see a shoreline on Sapelo Island that was eroding and um, came in and did a uh, natural shoreline project, including oysters, and it's stabilizing the bank while also providing um, marine uh, services. Beach uh, nourishment. Up here, we can see a Bell Island, Louisiana, um, a narrow beach subject to shoreline erosion, came in, took dredge materials, and basically filled, in, um, filled out the beach. And here we can see in Polly's Island, South Carolina, where the houses are right on the beach. They've been, done both beach nourishment and some dune restoration. This is the idea of using an engineered sill. In this case, it's, a, it's an oyster reef um, to basically make a sill offshore, um, which will still grow oysters and provide habitat for fish while also reducing wave energy on the shoreline. Now, the thing is, is we're gonna pay for coastal sea level rise one way or the other. We're gonna pay for it in either flood damages or we're gonna pay for it in nuisances or we're gonna pay for it in natural infrastructure improvement. We're gonna pay for it in relocations, um, acquisitions and relocations, policy changes, lifting buildings. We really gotta do a mix of policy, uh, conventional infrastructure and natural infrastructure projects to basically increase the resilience of these coastal environments because the sea level rise at this point um, is going to keep happening. I've provided some links here for, and, uh, for some things you can go look at for yourself to look at, at issues on uh, coastal sea level rise and some information about using natural infrastructure to increase the resilience of these systems. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much. And we have um, a comment came in that you might want to comment on too. Um, shoreline loss on the coast and on our barrier islands is also impacted by sediment starvation from rivers with big dams like the Savannah versus the Altamaha, which is not as impacted by dams. Restoring free flowing rivers is another nature based strategy for mitigating sea level rise. Um, is, is that a, a piece that you've looked at as well? It's a piece we're actually looking at. Um, whoever asked the question probably also knows, like at this point, the, there'd be some very major political challenges to taking out some of these big dams. But part of what we're doing is doing sediment budgets to look at um, changes in sediment movement down the rivers and how that's been affected by dams. And, and one other question, is there sort of a limit to the amount of sea level rises that these natural solutions can help with? I mean, is there a point where you've just got to retreat? Uh, this is a good question. Um, th the fact is, you know, we're going to have more flooding um, and we can deal with it a number of ways. All of these ways are going to change li people's lifestyles in, in one way or the other and going to cost money. And the real question is, is what's sort of the mix of strategies that we're going to use in these coastal communities? Um, and, you know, eventually maybe the market will partly dictate where people build and, and the like. Okay, thank you so much. And we'll go to our next panelist now. Um, Ari Manangan is a health scientist for the CDC's Climate and Health Program. Ari was the lead scientist on the development of a CDC best practices document for state and local health departments to quantitatively assess and identify at-risk communities to the health effects of climate change. His current work focuses on mapping the human health risks associated with a changing climate. Thanks for being here. All right, thanks. Can you guys hear me? Um, I'm trying to start my video as well and let me Tip to do that. There we go. I'll share my screen here. Hopefully, you guys can see that. My screen. Yes, looks great. All right. All right. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, almost lunchtime, but again, I'm Ari Manangan. I'm a health scientist and geographer for the CDC's Climate and Health Program. Uh, so today, I'm gonna, going to be talking about the risk of flooding to medical infrastructure. All right, so the CDC is focused on climate change because the impacts of climate change are very broad. Uh, from increasing the risk to vector-borne diseases such as West Nile virus and Lyme disease, to bringing more intense heat waves and a greater frequency of severe weather events that can cause flooding. So these climate, these changes in climate-related exposures translate into increasing health risk as seen in the outer circle of this diagram. So the Climate and Health Program has been funded by Congress since 2009, so we have actually been around for quite some time, um, although maybe being more discreet than other CDC programs. So much of our work uh, is being focused on building resilience to the health effects of climate change in states and local jurisdictions. So currently we fund, eight, we fund 18 cities and states in addition to 13 mini grants to states, cities, and tribes, and hopefully we can fund a lot more of, of these states and communities in the near future. Hopefully, hopefully we can expand this map. So that was just some background information on the, the Climate and Health Program where I work. Um, so now I'm gonna focus on a project that characterizes flood risk to health infrastructure. So according to the National Climate Assessment, there have been observed increases in both total precipitation and extreme precip precipitation, which may be contributing to a rise in flooding events as shown in these top maps, on, these maps on the right. The bottom right map show projected extreme precipitation changes under two different climate scenarios, which both show increasing trends throughout much of the US, including Georgia. The map on the left here shows historical trends in flood magnitude. So our objective of this project was to develop a national assessment of flood risk to medical infrastructure. We focused on hospitals, nursing homes, pharmacies, and dialysis clinics. And we really chose those because really they were the easiest data sets to get at the time because this is kind of a, a big undertaking uh, computationally. So to characterize flooding risk, we use data from FEMA's National Flood, Haz flood Hazard Layer, which some homeowners might be familiar with because if your home is in a designated flood zone, um, you are required to buy flood insurance when obtaining a home mortgage. So this is a diagram of the 100-year floodplain. This translates to a 1 in 100% chance of flooding in any given year, or 1%. 
FEMA also designates a 500-year flood plain, which translates to one in 500 chance or a 0.2% chance of flooding in any given year. So we conducted this, this analysis nationally, but we ended up running the analysis twice using two different flood data sets, uh, one from the FEMA and one from EPA. And each has its strengths and weaknesses due to data coverage and accuracy. The NFHL data is derived from very detailed topographic maps. These are the one to 24,000 scale maps that hikers might be um, uh, familiar with. But unfortunately, there are gaps in this data, such as in the coastal regions of South Carolina, Texas, and Louisiana. The EPA also provides a, uh, a data set. It's derived um, entirely for the, for the continental United States only, but is only limited to the 100-year floodplain and accuracy does not line up with this FEMA data, which is really considered the gold standard. So we used hospital data for our analysis from the American Hospital Association, but later on uh, we, we decided to use a different data set from Definitive Healthcare. We used nursing home data from Medicare dialysis clinics from, from Medicare, and also pharmacies, a national data set on pharmacies from OpenRx. Uh, again, this, this slide is a bit outdated. We did use the 2020 data set. And here are results of our analysis. Uh, and this is just focusing on hospitals for this map. Hospitals in the 100-year floodplain are in red, and those in the 500-year floodplain are in orange. So we ran this analysis for nursing homes, dialysis clinics, and pharmacies as well. Here we summarize the results at the national level. Um, there are actually, we were kind of surprised about the amount of hospitals and, and facilities uh, within these flood hazard areas. We see 9.3% of all hospitals are within a flood hazard area, 10.2% in nursing homes, 10.9% dialysis clinics, um, and 12.1% of pharmacies are within either a 100 year or 500 year floodplain. So for this presentation, we decided to aggregate our, our results just for the state of Georgia, so we could also do this regionally for any state. Uh, we see there are numerous facilities in flood hazard areas, but as compared to the rest of the United States, actually these percentages in Georgia are much lower. Here are our results on a map. Um, as, as, as I, did I tell you I'm a geographer and cartographer, so I'm really interested in mapping. So I, I had to put, the, put these uh, maps in here of the flood hazard areas. So we can see the facilities are spread throughout the state, but definitely there are areas in coastal regions that contain an abundant, abundance of facilities in a flood hazard area, in addition to other cities such as Macon, Georgia, right in the center of this map. So even though we did this assessment nationally, this data uh, is very detailed and actually can be used to inform local responses to flood events or even pl uh, future planning. So here's a map of our results focused on the Savannah, Georgia area all the way to Tybee Island. So those facilities are in, in red are within a flood hazard area. And what we've done, we combined all those four different types of facilities in this map. So taking a view back to the national scale, we have overlaid future projections of extreme precipitation. So this map is just really intended to illustrate those areas that may see increased risk to flooding in the near future. So what exactly do we do with this analysis? This really, analysis is really intended just to start the dialogue with healthcare stakeholders. Uh, for example, the operators of hospital systems and nursing home care facilities to make sure that our healthcare infrastructure is resilient to the effects of climate change. Um, here's our, some examples of adaptation strategies that could be implemented. Um, first of all, a relocating mission critical essential services. Uh, other examples would be to include placing electrical generators in the locations that cannot be easily flooded. What we've seen in Hurricane Katrina previously is that a lot of the generators were actually located in the basement and they flooded. Um, also, adaptation strategies would include developing evacuation planning and training of medical staff in such flooding emergencies. And also there's site modification, such as infilling of land and flood risk zones and the building of levees and walls. Um, and just like the previous presenter uh, uh, mentioned, the, the development of coastal flooding adaptations, which I thought was, thought was very interesting. So in conclusion, we found approximately 9% of hospitals, 10% of nursing homes, 10% of dialysis clinics and 12% of pharmacies were locate, located within a flood hazard risk. However, these percentages are considerably lower than the national average averages in Georgia, but there are numerous facilities in Georgia that are in a flood risk zone.
There are also regional differences in projected extreme precipitation in the future, which may increase the risk for flooding in areas with previously low flooding risks. So in that previous map I showed about precipitation, the northernmost part of Georgia is projected to have the greatest increase in extreme precipitation event. So there is a definite geographic variability in this flooding risk. And medical infrastructure facilities may experience more frequent flooding in the near future and should implement adaptation strategies to become more resilient. All right, I think that is it for my presentation. Thank you so much. Um, and just a reminder, folks can drop questions into the Q&A box and, and I will hopefully get to all of your questions and we'll have more time for questions at the end. Um, one question I have for you, Ari, is, um, you know, are you hearing a response from medical systems? Are folks, you know, taking this information and doing anything with it yet? Uh, yes, actually. So we, we presented this analysis before uh, pre uh, uh, past iterations of it. And we're kind of developing it more, but we've actually talked to um, big healthcare systems like the Cleveland Health Health Clinic. Um, you know, they're they're actually purchasing uh, facilities in Florida as well. It was, it was kind of interesting to talk to them, so they were very interested in this. So it, it is nice just to get um, that conversation started because they were not aware that they were located. You know, that they were so close to a flood hazard area or or near it. So that yes, they have they have taken this, but it would be nice to get some buy in. Um, also for our local uh, healthcare systems. And I see we got a comment in from Dr. Jackson saying the city of Charleston has been doing similar analysis of how flooding and power outages affect the reliability of the water and sewer systems. When they fail, it increases pressure on the medical systems too. So I think nice. that's an example, it's all connected. In a way. Um, and another question I had for you, and this you know maybe connects to, um, Marcia Gosier's presentation is, I mean, are you seeing equity patterns too? Or maybe that's not a level that, that you looked at, but you know, sort of where the systems are most at risk, are you seeing patterns? Mm -hmm. It was kind of interesting. And so we're developing a manuscript on this and I wanted to present it, but it was a little too early. We've actually looked at um, the rural versus urban risk. Um, and, and we're seeing there's definitely differences in that. Uh, we've taken that nationally, but you also see this, that geographic variability in different states. But also um, ju just poverty, poverty levels as well. We're also planning to look at uh, social vulnerability indices to see if there's different, um, different patterns in that as well. Thank you. Um, our next panelist is Aileen Daney. Aileen is the planning program manager with the Atlanta Regional Transit Link Authority. And in this role, she manages the development of the ATL Regional Transit Plan, the foundational document for future transit planning and the annual report and audit. She also leads other efforts like the Regional Fair Policy Study and the ATL's Local Transit Technical Assistance Program. Her background is in active transportation planning and performance-based planning. Aileen is motivated by a deep commitment to advance transit, walking, and bicycling as safe, equitable, and accessible means of transportation. Thank you, Molly. I just wanna confirm that you can hear me and see my screen. Yes, thank you. Great. Uh, well, thanks to the uh, Georgia Climate Project for the opportunity to present. Um, and Ari, I really enjoyed your presentation. I actually had a family member who was impacted during Sandy. Um, and so it's really interesting to see the work that's being done in Georgia. Uh, before I dive into what I'm going to talk about today related to Georgia's climate and transit, um, I want to just mention what the ATL is and um, who we are and where I'm coming from. So uh, the ATL was created in 2018. It's a regional planning and funding authority that's designed to provide a seamless transit experience across the 13 county Atlanta metro uh, region. And so we serve or we uh, cover 11 primary transit operators, uh, which is supplemented by uh, shuttle services and other private transit services. Um, and our, we are composed of 10 districts that are intentionally designed to cross jurisdictional boundaries, specifically county boundaries, to bring that regional coordination piece to light. Um, so we have five key functions to coordinate our regional partners, deliver innovative and best practice technology, strengthen regional transit planning and performance, advance strategic transit investments, and enhance customer experience. So that's background on the ATL. Uh, but what does this mean for Georgia's changing climate and transit? 
Um, the future landscape of the region is such that we are projected to add about 2 million residents by 2050. That's equivalent to the population of Denver moving to the, city, to the Atlanta region. Uh, we're also expected to add 1.2 million more jobs by 2050. We have a population that's aging right now. Uh, the population at 75 and over is at 4% in 2050. That's projected to be 12%. 77% um, of the region drives alone, less than 5% of our population commutes by transit, walks, or bikes to work. Um, so the, the takeaway from this is just that the region is growing, urbanizing, uh, we are adding stress to our transportation system, uh, and we cannot build or outwiden ourselves from this problem. Um, and last year, despite the pandemic, operators were able to provide 100 million transit trips in the region, um, and transit helped the region avoid 272 million VMT or vehicle miles traveled. It also saved the region $10 million in the social cost of emissions, um, and transit agency expenditures support 15,000 jobs and contribute to our regional uh, product. Um, so in 2020, as we reduced VMT through the stay at home orders um, and we had flexible teleworking schedules, the region's air quality was largely uh, in that moderate to good zone. Um, so this speaks to the power of transit and mobility options and their potential to influence the health of our community and also the health of our economy. Also last year, we know that many commuters were essential workers and they continue to rely on transit to get to their in-person jobs. Um, not everyone has the ability to telework. Uh, so providing access to transit is a matter of equity and racial justice. Frontline workers in the Atlanta region are likely to be black or African-American and people of Hispanic or Latino origin. In addition, 53% of the transit riders in the region have access to a car indicating that they are potential choice riders, so they have the option to take transit or the, another mobility option. Um, we couple this with the fact that teleworking is on the rise. We're looking at a really dramatically different landscape um, than pre-pandemic conditions. So I mentioned all of this to say that these factors combined, uh, our population growth, our travel patterns, our travel behavior, equity, health, mobility options, uh, these are the lenses through which I think about and we think about transit, climate, and how the ATL can fold that into our work program. Uh, so what does a changing climate mean for transit infrastructure? Um, Dr. Mallon touched on this a little bit um, in his presentation, but we know that intense precipitation can flood not only the roadways along which transit routes may occur, but also the maintenance and control facilities uh, for transit. The, the pictures here are from Crog Street, if you're familiar in Atlanta and the Cabbage Town neighborhood, and then the connector, um, the, the uh, project that uh, Marsha was mentioning earlier that um, demolished the uh, Buttermilk Bottoms neighborhood. Um, and then we know that extreme heat and drought can also cause rail buckling. We talked. Uh, Dr. Mallon talked about this as well. Um, not only rail buckling and derailing, we can also increase uh, air conditioning failures in extreme heat conditions. It increases electrical system failures, um, not just things like the vehicles, but um, uh, elevators, escalators, all the signal switches to make sure that uh, trains are running on the right tracks. It can accelerate tire deterioration for all of the, the fleets that um, operate on tire vehicles. It can worsen pavement conditions. Uh, it can reduce the frequency of rail car washing, which um, in a drought condition can make our, our uh, vehicles uh, a little more gritty than, than usual. It can also increase the failure of overhead wires. Um, Dr. Mallon mentioned this as well. Uh, out in Portland, uh, they had to suspend service uh, because their power cable cables were melting. Uh, they also had to suspend uh, safely working on fixing those power cables because it was too hot. Um, so things like that are, are, are definitely more prevalent um, and a part of this changing climate landscape. But aside from infrastructure, it also has real implications for transit workers and transit customers. Uh, so for workers, it can increase their exposure to extreme heat. It can cause heat stress and injury. It's already touched on all the health risks that are associated with um, these in, uh, extreme conditions. Uh, it can require training about how to operate service during extreme weather conditions. It can also in, increase the need for 
a transit worker to uh, pivot their role from providing a service to a facilities and infrastructure inspection role. Um, for customers, we know that every uh, person who takes transit is a pedestrian first. Uh, so they're increased, they are in an increased heat exposure condition and therefore potentially increased discomfort. Um, and really we know that we want people to access transit with dignity. So we need to provide transit stop amenities like shade and benches, places for them to rest, uh, provide sidewalks so that they can access transit, provide a tree canopy so that there's a natural shade and cooling component. And then we know that this increased service disruption caused by climate change and these delays uh, mean a reduced reliability of transit and therefore an erosion of customer trust in taking transit. Uh, but I say all this not to be just doom and gloom. Um, you know, there, there is a role for a regional agency to play, even though a lot of this work is also happening locally at the operator level and the city level. Uh, so for the ACL, how can we build resilience into our work? Um, we're looking at future program at areas such as establishing a state of good repair program that would balance both these changing climate needs and the operational safety needs, um, getting at things like you know, we're going to have to replace vehicles quicker now uh, with deteriorating conditions happening faster. How can we reduce uh, our carbon emissions replacing fleet vehicles with something less carbon intense? Um, we're looking to create a regional zero emission fleet transition plan, moving all of our fleets from either, uh, you know, where they are now, gas, diesel, to something electric and alternative source. Uh, we also want to establish a first mile, last mile connectivity program. Like I mentioned before, how do we safely get folks to transit? Um, should we focus on areas that ha are most impacted by the urban heat island effect? Um, and also, there's a programmatic effort here in, in terms of marketing and education. How do we get people uh, either back to transit for those choice riders or to reboot their commute, to reconceptualize their commute? Um, and it's Going back to that regional zero emission fleet transition program, I just want to mention we were recently awarded a, a $5.4 million grant, um, which you can see Senator Ossoff highlighted here, to help replace some of those diesel vehicles with electric vehicles. Uh, but it's not just programmatic. We're thinking about this in project development ways. The Atlanta Regional Commission, or ARC, has a tool called City Simulator that models extreme heat as well as flooding events in the region. Um, so layering that in with our prioritization process to understand uh, what transit and transportation assets are vulnerable. Um, we can even model what specific mitigation measures might be the most cost effective. Uh, we're creating a priority regional transit network. How can we focus our investments uh, to get people where they really want to go? We're creating a regional funding strategy and a regional approach to project delivery. So aligning project needs and benefits with funding opportunities. Some of those funding opportunities could focus on sustainability um, and equity. So we want to make sure that uh, the region is ready to compete for those funds. And then we're also looking at future policies. How can we support and promote uh, transit supported land use? Whether this is through a regional TOD strategy so that we're we're targeting certain uh, development areas um, and then developing a climate action strategy as a component to that. How can we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions at a regional level? Uh, so that's a lot of information, but uh, that's what the ATL is working on. And that's really where we see uh, the regional role coming into play. Thank you. Um, and it sounds like there's a lot of sort of you're doing a lot of laying groundwork, a lot of planning um, and looking for funding. Is there something that's sort of a, a low hanging fruit example that you're like, listen, once, you know, once we get the approval, if we can just get some money, like we can go and do this. Like what, you know, what are the things that would be kind of first steps for you? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, Georgia recently passed a ride share fee, uh, which has a 25 cent and 50 cent uh, fee on Lyft and Uber rides that goes into a transit trust fund. And so being able to pull down money from that transit trust fund that then leverages potentially other local dollars or federal dollars would be a great place to start because that pot of funding is new and because the ATL is three years old, we're, you know, we're trying to figure out sort of how do we put those projects forward and put them in the best light in front of the state to, to really um, make the case for investing in transit. 
Right. And it seems like, I mean, transit's in sort of this interesting place where it's both um, something that's affected by the problems of climate change, but also is a piece of the solution. I mean, right, so you've got, I mean, I feel like I'm going to not phrase this well, but it's sort, you're sort of on both pieces of the puzzle in a way, right? Yeah, I think we feel that a little bit, um, especially in comparison to our roadway counterparts. Um, you know, transit is often asked, what can you do to um, help with climate change? And I don't know that we're asking that same question of, you know, where roadway dollars are going and um, how much attention and level of detail goes into that planning. So um, I do, we do feel the, the, the question on both sides for sure. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, and we'll again, we'll come back and and get you know group questions for everybody um, soon. We have one more presenter, and we're going to stay on the transportation piece. Ali Kelly is with us. She Ali is the executive director of the Ray, and she has helped the organization implement nearly a dozen groundbreaking technology demonstrations, including the first solar road in the United States and the world's first public demonstration of a drive-through tire safety station. Ali has nearly 20 years of experience working in public policy, first as a lobbyist for UPS in Washington, DC, then founding Georgia Watch in Atlanta, the state's only consumer watchdog organization. She was also listed as one of the 100 women to know by Engineering Georgia in 2018, 2019, and again in 2021. Ali, thanks for being with us. Hi, Molly, it's great to see you. And thank you so much for including the Ray in this program. Um, I'm actually coming to you from the Ray Highway. We just hosted U.S. Senator John Ossoff on his first field tour of the Ray. So I apologize for the um, uh, not great background and lighting, <laughs> but um, we're really glad to be a part of this program today. And if it's okay, I'm gonna share screen with some slides and talk about uh, what, what changing climate means for Georgia's infrastructure on the highway and interstate system and talk about um, a couple of options and solutions for what we can do about it. Um, first of all, just a little bit of background about the Ray Highway. Um, the Ray does refer to Ray Anderson. Ray Anderson is our namesake. Um, born in uh, West Point, Georgia, um, started and founded Interface Carpet Company in LaGrange, Georgia. Um, built a billion dollar company out of a startup. And then in the 1990s, during the Clinton era, <laughs> it's just amazing for me to think about 1993, 1994, Ray Anderson was concerned about carbon and he challenged his own company to go zero waste to landfill, zero carbon, more renewable energy and more wastewater reuse. Um, he set the path for those goals to be reached by the company by 2020. He documented savings of over $400 million in going green at Interface. And the company announced over the COVID year that they are carbon neutral and that they are nearly zero waste to landfill, about 98% towards the goal that Ray set for them. It's an amazing example of how corporations can be activated and ignited around corporate sustainability and the circular economy. When Ray passed away in 2011, um, former Governor Nathan Deal and the Georgia State Legislature worked with Ray's surviving family, specifically Ray's youngest daughter, Harriet Anderson Langford, to dedicate a stretch of Interstate 85 in West Georgia, I-85 that connects West Point at the West Point Reservoir and LaGrange, Georgia, right up against the Georgia-Alabama state line. That 18 mile stretch of highway is now officially known as the Racy Anderson Memorial Highway. And then Harriet turned around and leveraged some of her family's philanthropy from the Racy Anderson Foundation to jumpstart a nonprofit, which we now call the Ray. In five and a half years, we've onboarded more than a dozen projects onto the 18 mile corridor. And in the process, we've developed the nation's premier test bed for sustainable and safe interstate transportation technology. So we're leveraging Ray's Memorial Highway to help new technologies and innovations debut onto a public working interstate. And our focus like Ray's are, is to prove that the technologies exist for transportation on interstates and highways to go zero carbon, zero deaths and zero waste. You can see from this map the overview of some of the projects that we've done. We now have a charter with Georgia DOT and the Federal Highways Administration that makes this work permanent. And the charter specifically emphasizes sustainability, innovation, and safety as our common goals uniting Georgia DOT, the Federal Highways Administration, and the Ray. 
After developing the robust test bed, we've actually been scaling some of our projects to other states. The Ray Highway is now active in 14 states working with almost two dozen transportation organizations. Um, we have active projects involving right-of-way renewable energy generation, right now ongoing in Colorado, Minnesota, Texas, South Carolina, Maryland, Maine, and also with the Tollway and Turnpike Authorities in Indiana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, just to name a few. We also have connected and autonomous vehicle projects coming online in Texas with Texas DOT and with the city of Austin. Um, I could keep going on and on, but I invite you to learn more about the Ray at www.theray.org. I want to talk specifically about climate change and interstate infrastructure with the time that I have remaining. Um, first and foremost, important for y'all to understand that we have a waste problem in the transportation sector and the circular economy has never really been um, applied to transportation. We want to start with tires. The United States is producing 300 million waste tires every year. And like carpet tile, scrap tires don't break down in landfills. Um, usually they bio persist for 80 to 100 years. So the 300 million scrap tires that we produce as waste in this country this year will still be there in 2021. And the year after that, and the year after that, 300 million more and rising. There is an opportunity that we are missing in this country and that is to use rubber from scrap tires reclaimed and added to asphalt binder. Rubber modified asphalt is not a new technology. However, it is not in common use in this country. Um, Arizona and Georgia have become states that use rubber modified asphalt on a regular basis, but we have a lot to do, um, a lot of work to do with other states. And we aim to lift up the Ray Highway and other paving projects in the state of Georgia as best in class examples of how we can upcycle scrap tire rubber into high performing roads. Um, Federal Highways Administration actually funded a mile of rubber modified asphalt on the Ray Highway itself covering all four lanes. So the first mile of the Ray, when you come into Georgia from Alabama, all four lanes are paved with rubber modified asphalt as a surface course of the road, as well as the next two inches of underlying course. Um, we were able just with one mile of a paving project to upcycle 42,240 pounds of scrap tires. But you may be asking yourself, what does this have to do with climate change? Well, actually modifying asphalt roads with scrap tire rubber creates more resilient roads. These are roads that last 50% longer or more. They are crack resistant because the rubber particles actually pin the cracks, which prevents them from spreading. Um, they're quieter for electric vehicles. They have better skid resistance for safer travel. They enable the state DOTs and contractors to use a looser rock mix in the asphalt and using a looser rock mix actually helps with heavy rain environments like we get here in the south. We call them gully washers. And if you have a tight, a tightly locked into place aggregate mix with really angular rock, the water pools on the surface of the road and causes unsafe hydroplaning and splashback, which affects our driving visibility. So rubber modified asphalt binder allows us to use looser rock mixtures, which create irregular voids for the water to actually work itself off of the road. Also, we believe that using rubber and asphalt mixtures actually wears less on the tires. So stay with me. <laughs> we get less tire wear, less particulate matter or PM 2.5 from tire wear by using rubber in the asphalt binder mix. Also, I just came from a press conference at the one megawatt roadside solar site on the Ray. This is the best in class in the United States utilization of highway and interstate roadsides for clean energy generation. As you can see, this is a Georgia power plant was commercialized in February of the COVID year. It's a megawatt of DC capacity over just uh, more than four acres, um, 2,600 high efficient solar panels, and the understory around and underneath the solar panels are growing native perennial pollinator friendly habitats. So plants and grasses that bloom to provide habitat and a food source for bees, 
butterflies and other pollinators. You may know in West Georgia, like the rest of the state, um, we have a lot of local farms, particularly blueberry production in West Georgia. And those local farmers need wild pollinators to keep their harvests healthy. And so projects such as this one allow us to use empty, eroded, and degraded roadside land, which the DOT is paying millions of dollars to to maintain and upkeep, and it allows us to leverage that land for clean energy generation, as well as for pollinator habitat to replenish the soils, enable the soils that are replenished to store more carbon, and it holds our soils from washing away in gully washers and creating erosion and sedimentation of our nearby waterways. And last but not least, we have a, so a solar powered EV charging station on the Ray. <laughs> this is a massive policy issue. I'm going to just say it really quickly. Um, we cannot scale EV charging at our interstate rest areas and visitor centers currently because there is a prohibition on charging for EV charging. So we cannot allow companies like ChargePoint or Tesla to charge a fee for the service of their EV charging stations. And we are looking to our leaders like Senator John Ossoff to address this 1960s era policy that is holding back EV charging from proliferating on our interstate system. Um, at the Ray, we offer ours for free, which is why we can have EV charging. It's 175 kW station that can power all the way up to 350 kW when we're ready by simply adding another pedestal. So this is a great modular option provided by a company called ABB. It's grid tied so that it works overnight on the interstate system at the rest area, but it's also getting the benefit of clean energy from 12 solar panels held aloft. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. And again, appreciate the opportunity to talk about our work on the Ray Highway and invite all of you to follow us on social media at the Ray Highway. Thank you, Allie. And after um, a couple questions for Allie, we're gonna go to um, back to the whole group. So if you all have questions for anyone who's presented or questions for multiple people, you can go ahead and start putting those in and we'll get to them. Um, a couple for you. What, you know, what's, what's holding this back from being more widely adopted? Why, why aren't we seeing, I mean, it, it's cool to see that, that you've got the Ray spreading in a couple other states. Um, why not all of them? The broad answer, Molly, is that transportation is a very conservative, risk-averse sector. So I jokingly say that my um, microwave is smarter and has more functionality than our road system. And is, that is no more true than on the interstate and highway system, where people are driving at high rates of speed. Also, the interstate and the highway system is the lifeblood of our commerce. That's where manufacturing, logistics, um, delivery, uh, all of those activities are taking place with really large vehicles, right? Trucks, heavy trucks, medium duty vans. And so that entire profile of transportation on the interstate and highway system means that DOTs are risk averse. Um, they are also highly regulated in this high speed environment. And so what we aim to do at the Ray is to utilize philanthropy. We have philanthropy from foundations like the Ray C. Anderson Foundation, the Energy Foundation, the McKnight Foundation, we also leverage corporate philanthropy. So um, Kia Georgia is one of our big supporters. And just so you know, none of the technologies that are in the ecosystem on the Ray Highway, we don't take money from any of those companies. So we're not pay to play, um, but we do utilize other corporate philanthropy to help make these projects come to life in Georgia and in other states. And our model is that philanthropy can help to facilitate projects and reduce the risk associated with DOTs trying new things. We're seeing that model actually take root across the country as our work spreads to other states. And you'll notice from the map, um, we, aren't, we aren't doing a lot of work in, in places where there are already a lot of resources around climate change, around um, connected and autonomous vehicles around electric vehicles. We don't have anything against Washington State, nothing against California, but our work is deliberately focused in areas where the resources do not already exist for us to address climate change in the transportation sector. 
And, and when it comes to electric vehicles, um, you know, are there, what are the challenges? For instance, um, you know, gas tax funding, I think gets brought up with EVs. I know Georgia has a fee on electric vehicles um, partially to address that, but um, you know, how, how do you address questions around that? Yeah, I mean, the, there are a myriad of challenges around electric vehicles, um, yet we press on because that is our opportunity to decarbonize transportation. Um, I should have started by saying the transport sector is now the number one sector contributing to greenhouse gases in the United States. Transportation accounts for about 29% of all GHG. And electric vehicles in the short term are the way for us to decarbonize both the passenger and the commercial vehicle space. Um, the challenges are number one, the charging infrastructure. So making the right decisions about the right power to provide. On the interstate and highway system, the Ray believes that we need to be offering 150 kW or higher no 50 kW, no level two on the interstate system because people, drivers will have a bad experience. They'll be stuck for two, four, six hours trying to get enough charge to reach their next destination. Um, also affordability and accessibility. So on the one hand, I wanna say the Ford F-150 Lightning, the price tag is $39,000. That is an amazing price tag when you look at the rest of the market for an EV pickup truck. And the Lightning does have vehicle to grid capability Abilities. So you're actually not just getting an electric vehicle pickup truck, but you're also kind of getting a generator, right? A backup generator for your house. It's an amazing product. But let's be honest, new vehicle ownership is not attainable for everyone. And honestly, EV ownership is not, um, is not appropriate, is not, is not what everyone is going to opt into. And so we're really trying to um, create programs for people to car share, or participate in EV leasing programs so that we can help all um, types of American families, um, middle income and low income families to those that are underbanked and um, unbanked to be able to opt into electric vehicles when vehicles are the right option. But we're also supporting the electrification of bus transit. We support regional rail and inner city rail. And we also are very supportive of micro mobility options as they um, persist in, and grow in the urban environments. Great, thank you. Um, and now I think we can open it up and have all of the panelists. Um, you, can, you all can come back to us. Um, Dr. Jackson had to leave early, so he will not rejoin us, but um, everyone else. And Ali, I think if you can stop screen sharing. Oh, sorry, duh, Molly. <laughs> um, Ari, uh, and, and you all in the audience, please send in your questions and we'll get to them. And there were a couple we didn't get to before, so, so we'll bounce back to them too. Ari, I had a question for you though. For, for folks who are curious about their own local hospitals or you know, maybe the nursing home that they've got older relatives in, is it possible to look up your data set? Is that publicly available for folks to, to use? Um, not quite yet. You know, we're still formulating um... And, and finalizing the analysis. But yeah, that, that is a great question because especially in, in nursing homes, I know I have a, a grandmother in a nursing home and you know, I think a lot of people are concerned about that. But yeah, that is the future plan. There is the environmental public health tracking portal that we are planning to put that data on. Um, but we also have to be cognizant as well be, with, with, you know, we don't want to have this map and saying, oh yeah, CDC says, that your nursing home is on a flood hazard area. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're um, risk. Maybe they've already had, they've taken some adaptations to, to make them more resilient. So we also, we're at, that's why we're actually working with uh, the, the healthcare sector um, and working with them just like, hey, you know, we just wanna make you cognizant of that. So um, we do have to be careful on, you know, uh, talking about risk to flooding because Every facility is, is different. Um, you know, there, there's access, there's access uh, issues as well. Um, but yes, that is a plan, but we're also being very careful with that. But, but you also want to be transparent as well, because you know, you're right, you do want to know, hey, is my, is my uh, nursing home that my grandmother is, is in, it, you know, is it, is it okay? And one thing you can do is maybe just call that nursing home or that, that hospital and say, hey, um, are you guys, do you guys have a, a adaptation plan or a, or a evacuation plan? Are, are you guys more resilient? So you, you can ask questions like that as well. Great, thank you. Um, and Marsha, there were, we had a couple questions that came in written um, earlier, right after your presentation, and you responded in writing, but I thought it would be nice to ask 
for the whole group too, so that folks that missed that can, can see them. Um, one was the Biden administration's initial definition of funding to disadvantaged communities was very vague. Do you have advice to federal agencies on how to be specific about the communities we really need to reach with funding? Actually, let um, unmute yourself. That will most definitely help. I shared a link um, in the chat. I don't know if everyone was able to see it, but yes, integrants, it, it was very vague when it was first placed out there. They uh, have been way more transparent in their verbiage. And I placed the link for the Justice 40 Accelerator. I don't know if you all are familiar with the uh, nonprofit Groundswell, but they, they are one of the partners along with the Partnership for Southern Equity. And we actually have information on our website about it, but I shared the, the link uh, for the Justice 40 Accelerator because the we want to, is actually set up to ensure that the money that flows down just don't go to our larger nonprofits like the Partnership for Southern Equity Groundswell uh, and you know even the rate to even for us to apply for these as well and to ensure that it gets to those targeted areas. But uh, it has specifically stated um, Black communities, um, Native American communities, our Latinx communities. So they have made adjustments as far as that is concerned. Um, I know that the Justice 40 has webinars every Tuesday and Thursday, I believe they listed on their website. And again, they actually have some funding with a, a target date of July 9th, I believe. And, but I put the link in there, don't, don't quote me on that, but it is justice40accelerator.org. And it is, it is a straightforward um, application process. Um, everyone doesn't have to have 5013C funding. Uh, so that's, that's always a good thing to know. And so what we try to do, like at the Partnership for Southern Equity, we will actually apply for those fundings and then just trickle that down and make it easier. And we're, we're very intentional about actually saying it, okay, th this money is for organizations that specifically speak to Black communities, Latina communities, and low wealth communities, and in particular rural uh, communities, because a lot of times, you know, those areas are forgotten about. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. And Evan, actually, th thinking about rural communities, I think there were two parts of your presentation that were surprising to me, and that I realized I was making certain assumptions probably about the urban heat island in general, but one that you said that rural areas are, are, are you found are, can be more at risk, um, and two, that it mattered more how the building was built, if it was a, a home or an apartment building, more than the urban heat island. Were there other things that were sort of surprising to you, or that like if someone like me is making certain assumptions about <laughs> what risky areas are, um, kind of run contrary to that from, from your study? Sure. So I, um, <clears throat> I do want to be clear that it's not so much uh, a greater risk in rural areas due to higher exposure uh, due to temperature, because of course we have higher temperatures in urban areas. However, what we found though is, is that the, um, the urban heat island penalty, as we call it, that kind of increase in temperature due to the urban heat island is not as great as what you have in terms of the housing. And so in rural areas, you're just as exposed unless you're surrounded by more trees. You have that kind of direct shading. Um, and so more research on that forthcoming. Uh, but um, I think one of the things that we need to explore more is uh, that relative risk curve that I showed in my presentation, the, the difference between Northern and Southern cities. Uh, and I, I think that we just didn't know how bad it could get in interior temperatures. So Phoenix um, got over uh, 128 degrees. Uh, that means that it did actually reach that extreme danger range. And we just don't have um, studies that have shown that. And with these unprecedented heat waves that we're having in the Northwest and Northeast right now, uh, we just don't know how bad it could be, how sharp that could get. And so I think that was particularly eye-opening. And certainly uh, we expected the temperatures to be bad, but we didn't expect them to be that bad. Uh, and so that was really an eye-opening piece of this research, I think. Um, so that's something we need to keep exploring moving forward for sure. Um, but yeah, I'm glad that uh, just to, to um, give a little bit more of a shout out to Marsha, I'm glad that she brought up this energy burden question. And so this is something that, uh, you know, we, we cannot just push as let's have more air conditioning. It's, it's through this research we're realizing just how much of a life support system this air conditioning can be. 
and how even today without a blackout, we have people who can't afford to own or operate it. Uh, and so that is, is something that we absolutely need to be um, prioritizing. Thank you. And Marsha, you've got a hand raised. Are you? Yes. <laughs> um, I wanted to, um, and I, I guess Allie would be the subject matter expert in this. I, I just really want to applaud the work uh, that you all are doing with the Ray. I, I believe I have the answer on this, but I just wanted to get your thoughts on it. How hard have you, have you seen where it is harder to get money trickled down for transportation to rural areas? Um, you know, because a lot of times, you know, as, as we, we all know, if we're using the transportation systems, yes, we want dignity in that. But a lot of times in rural pockets, we're seeing that we have a lot of pedestrians. Uh, we don't see a lot of sidewalks, even when we have access, access to highways and, you know, maybe partnering together to try to use some of uh, the tires that you, you mentioned to try to get those for sustainability on the roadways in rural areas, uh, because they, they're, they're definitely uh, impacted by it. Um, you know, as far as your potholes are concerned, uh, just small things that we take for granted, uh, not having lights, you know, on the on the byways, just it, extreme darkness um, at night, you're having to fight trucks, you're having to fight industrial pollution, you're, you're, you're having to deal with new construction and uh, roadkill, animals being displaced, but how hard have you seen or are you seeing a push to try to get transportation in rural areas or get monies trickled down? I appreciate that question so much and I resemble all of those remarks. <laughs> um, this is a struggle every day in rural areas um, and I'm just going to answer it quickly in a couple different ways. You know, number one, there's an opportunity right now. Um, LMIG money in Georgia is being made avail available to counties and that LMIG money, which is, um, I'm going to forget the whole acronym, but it's basically local mobility improvement grants, I think is what they're called. Um, but we can use those for safety. So we can use those for better striping. Um, we can use those for signage, for crosswalks. Um, we can use LMIG dollars to help focus on safety and mobility in um, all counties of the country, including rural counties. And so um, that just basic infrastructure is in need of repair and also in need of modernization. Um, I hate to bore people talking about striping, but your community is not going to be safe for autonomous vehicle operation over the next five to 10 years until you upgrade your lane lines. If an AV, if an autonomous vehicle can't see the lane lines, then it will not operate in your area. It simply won't be able to operate safely because that is a basic ingredient is it has to know what lane markings indicate where it needs to maintain the lane. So something as simple as lane lines for rural and disadvantaged communities needs to be our focus over the next five to 10 years. And we can utilize LMIG dollars in the state of Georgia specifically for that. Um, with rubber modified asphalt, the trickle down in innovation is also a problem. So Georgia is one of the countries in the, uh, one of the states in the US that actually utilizes some rubber and asphalt. We always need to be doing more because we're certainly creating the waste tires <laughs> and we need to be sharing the information with other states. Um, no criticism of GDOT, but I think it's hard to trickle down innovation to local governments and local governments have paving projects. And so one of the things that we're focused on at the Ray that we would love assistance and co uh, collaboration from other organizations is how to lift up local governments and their paving projects to be able to tap into some of this um, innovation. I didn't show the slide, but before we did rubber modified asphalt on the Ray with federal highways, we actually two years earlier in 2017 did it with Troop County. So Troop County's first rubber modified road was done okay. in 2017, um, thanks to the facilitation of that technology for the local government. So there's a lot of opportunity there as well. And I, I, I could keep going, but you know, a, 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 it is, we will not have EV charging infrastructure in rural areas unless we open up rest areas and visitor centers to host that charging. I cannot emphasize that enough. We have to modernize the policy to allow for EV charging at rest areas in rural 
areas in rural parts of the state and rural parts of the country. Um, I say free don't scale, and I mean it. We have a free charging station at the Ray, uh, the visitor center on the Ray, but that is not national policy. Free don't scale. We need to unlock public-private partnerships with DOTs across the country to be able to offer EV charging infrastructure at rest areas. Our one charging station opened up the 85 corridor between Montgomery and Atlanta, two capital cities, and we need to repeat that model across the state of Georgia on I-20, 75, and other corridors corridors as well as across the southeast, honestly. Very great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'll be reaching out to you. <laughs> awesome. Allie at the ray.org. <laughs> well, I hate to jump in and cut off this amazing conversation, but I know we are a little over time, but as we wrap things up, I would like to just say a huge thank you to this incredible panel of experts we've had today. I mean, Marsha, Rhett, Ali, Evan, Ari, and our fabulous moderator, Molly, thank you so much for helping us navigate all this, as well as there's some of our other organizers behind the scenes, Joel Gamble, Daniel Rockberg, Taylor Lamb, Kara Spenke, and I, of course, IT support from Brandon Ellis. We'll be sending a follow-up link to all of the attendees here today. So if you want a recording of this, or you want to go back and look at some things or share with others, you'll be getting that as well, in addition to a survey about this webinar today. We'll also be sending out some other conference updates and exciting things from people in Georgia and our network. But many thanks to everyone who attended and again, the people who spoke and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thanks again.